The walls of the city of Jerusalem were mere rubble. This news made Nehemiah very sad, so Nehemiah began to rebuild. He led the people day in and day out. Enemies attacked, but they overcame. God helped them finish the work in only 52 days. The Jews who had once been in captivity now returned home. Change your world in 52 days. The story of Nehemiah. How you doing this morning? You doing good? Yeah. Well, I want to welcome you guys to our fourth and final week of our series called Change Your World in 52 Days. How many of us have enjoyed this series? Yeah. Been challenged by this series? I don't know, I have. And, and, and in this series, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. And today, we're actually going to be studying chapter 6 as we talk about finishing Strong, But before we jump into it, I want to take a moment to look into the camera and welcome the men and women joining us from the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio, also known as CCNO. We love you guys. We believe in you. Come on, church. Help me welcome our church family. It's awesome. Well, if you're new with us or haven't had a chance to be here with us during this series, let me give you a little background information as to what is going on. The year is 444 B.C. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, who's the king of Persia. And, and a cupbearer is simply someone who would taste the wine before the king to make sure that there wasn't any poison in it and that it was fit for the king to drink, And so Nehemiah is basically this glorified butler. His life is disposable, just an ordinary guy. And one day his brother, who was a part of a Jewish remnant, comes to visit him and tells him uh, all the things, how bad things have gotten back in their hometown of, in their homeland of Jerusalem. That the, the city walls that surround the, the city, that protect the people, have been torn down. That the, the city gates... Uh, uh, have been burned with fire. Their, their people have been taken into captivity. They are being humiliated. God's name is being mocked, and nobody is doing anything about it. And this, this ordinary guy, this cupbearer, gets this divine, just this divine burden. He, he wasn't a warrior. He wasn't in a, in a position of power. God just gave him this divine burden to the point that he was, his heart was broken, even to the point of tears. And he just said, man, somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. And so in week number one of this series, we talked about how there's some things in our lives where we've just come to the point where we've said, you know what, enough is enough. There's some other things that God has laid upon our hearts to do where we've come to the point, man, somebody's got to do something, it might as well be me. And so as the story continues with Nehemiah, he decides to take a step outside of his comfort zone to change the world around him. And he works up the courage to go before the king and ask permission to, to travel uh, 850 to 1,000 miles back to his homeland of Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls. And this is a big deal because you don't just go before the king. You don't talk in the king's presence, number one, and you, you surely don't ask him for permission to, to do anything. And in fact, the king could actually kill you right on the spot. If he thought you were trying to rebel, if he thought you were trying to pull a fast one on him, he could kill you right there on the spot. And so it was a big deal for Nehemiah to even open his mouth in the king's presence. And as he has the courage to ask the king for permission to, to go back and rebuild the wall, God moves on the king's heart. And not only does the king say yes, but then he sends with Nehemiah some army officers in this cavalry to escort Nehemiah back to Jerusalem and show his support. And so in week number two of this series, we learned that we don't have to be the best to change the world around us. We just have to care the most. And so Nehemiah shows back up in, in Jerusalem. He starts rallying the people to start this endeavor. And how many of us know it wasn't easy? Like everything didn't go smooth, that they ran into some resistance, they ran into some challenges, they ran into some struggles. And last week we talked about how we don't face opposition because we're doing something wrong, we face opposition because we're doing something 
right. And so Nehemiah is rallying these people to, to start this project and this endeavor. And God ends up using them to do this incredible thing that nobody thought was even possible. And today as we kind of close this series and take a look at the life and example of Nehemiah, I want to talk to us about how we can finish strong. And if you're anything like me, I've noticed in my life that I can be a good starter, but not necessarily a great finisher. Anybody relate to me this morning? For example, you know how many diets I have started in my lifetime? Like 750,000 diets. But you know how many diets I've finished? Well, it depends on your definition of finish because I finished every single one of them and it's usually an hour or two after I started them. I'm a great starter, but not necessarily a great finisher. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I was I had the opportunity to work out with a pastor friend of mine from Bryan, Ohio, Pastor Michael Elkins from New Hope Church. And he's a big CrossFit guy, loves doing CrossFit workouts. And, and I don't mind doing that. It's a little bit of a change of pace. And so a couple of weeks ago, we're working out together. And I think it's important for the story that you know that we had already ran a mile and a half on the treadmill. We had already done overhead squats and some heavy, heavy squatting. And he goes, hey, let's just finish this workout with a, with a CrossFit doubles workout. I'm like, all right, bro. I mean, it's your world. I'm just living in it. Whatever you want to do, man. Like, let's, let's go to work. And he goes, all right, well, it'll be four exercises. We'll start off with some wall ball shots, which is this medicine ball. And you do a squat and you come up and you throw the, the, um, the medicine ball and hit this target that's 10 feet up in the air and hits the target, comes back down. And you catch it, do another squat, and keep doing that, do 10 of those. And then, then we'll go over to this like ski slash row machine. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. I've never even skied, but I'm like, I don't care, bro. Let's go. I can do it. And so you got these little two cables and you pull down them like you're skiing. And there's resistance and it records how far you go. And he goes, let's, let's do 10 calories worth, which is about a minute. And, and then we'll do push-ups. We'll do 10 push-ups. 10 push-ups? Are these like one-handed push-ups? Like 10? Is that even doing anything? But I'll do it, bro. No problem. I'll do 10 push-ups for you. And he's like, then we'll finish it off with 50 double-unders. We'll do those four exercises. I'm thinking, no problem. So we're going to do this once. We're going to go around once. He goes, no, no, we'll do it for 25 minutes. I said, 25 who? What are you talking about? 25 minutes. I don't, I think I misunderstood you. And uh, I, I ain't doing it for 25 minutes. Like you clearly don't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, bro. I ain't doing it for 25 minutes. But he's like, well, we'll just, you'll go first. After you do your medicine ball, wall ball shots, and you go over, don't do the ski machine until I get done. And that's how we'll, we'll rest and we'll keep going that way and work through it for 25 minutes. And so I'm like, all right, let's just go to work. Let's just do this. I'm down for whatever. If you can do it, I can do it. If you can do it, I can do it, you know? And so we start, I start off with the wall ball shots, and I mean, you've been so proud of me. I mean, I was going down and up and catching the thing, and I threw the medicine ball down when I got the tent. I sprint over to the, the ski machine. I grab my rope. It's like, come on, bro. Let's go. Get your wall ball shot. I'm ready to row this thing. I'm ready to ski this thing. He gets done, and I'm skiing it. I'm pulling on this thing as hard. I got done in 45 seconds. Like, I was a beast on that thing. And I get down, ready to do my 10 Mickey Mouse push-ups that aren't doing anything. I pop them bad boys out. And then I go over to my 50 double-unders, and I'm doing this. I'm like, what? What you want to do? I got these 50 double-unders. But after I got done doing those 50 double-unders, I started to get a little more tired than I thought I was going to get. So I'm no longer sprinting to the next exercise. I'm kind of just kind of jogging over there to him, and I do my wall ball shots, and I'm no longer jogging, I'm just kind of walking over to the ski machine at this point, I'm pulling on it, it takes me about a minute and a half to do it this time, and then all of a sudden I get down and do my 10 push-ups, and then next you know I'm, I'm crawling to the jump rope to do these, and next you know I'm rolling on the ground to my next exercise, I'm like, whoo, this, this thing's, I, I didn't know it was going to be this hard, so, so I look at the clock, like how far, how long we've been doing this, like 20 minutes, like 18, how long do we still have left in this ridiculous partner workout, and I look over, and I kid you not, we had been doing it for a minute and a half. I still have 23 and a half minutes to go. I'm like, I ain't got it, bro. I we just, no, we ain't doing this. So then the negotiation started in the middle of work. I'm like, bro, I ain't going to make 25 minutes. He's like, you got it. I go, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I ain't doing 25 minutes. I'm telling you that. I go, and so I'm starting to negotiate. 15. And he goes, let's do 20. I'm like, all right, I'll do, I'll do 20 minutes worth. And so as your pastor rep in Experience Church, I went ahead and gutted the 20 minutes out. But, I mean, there's places on my body sweating. I didn't even know. Come on. You can clap for that. Ain't letting New Hope Church and Brian beat us. 
Come on, somebody. Ain't going there. Bless you. Hope God moves in your life, but come on. But there was places on my body sweating. I didn't even, my toenails were sweating. I didn't even know that was possible. Like I was shot at the end of 20 minutes. I just fell over right there in the middle of the gym and just laid on the floor, passed out. People were stepping over me to work out. I didn't care. I was done. The point is, man, I started out good, didn't I? I was sprinting from exercise, but I didn't finish so well, and maybe you can relate to me uh, this morning with some things in, in your life. Maybe God's called you to do some things in your life, and you started out well, right? But maybe God put in your heart to really grow in your faith and, and maybe make church a priority. And like, we just know we just need to be there. Not, not in a religious way, like we got to be here every day and punch a time clock. And if we don't show up to church, God's mad at us. No, no, no. Just because I know I need to be there and get around other people who are growing in their faith because there's power when we come into this room and we worship God together. And I know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And there's just something that God does when there's the preaching of the word. And God's just doing something in me. I just know I need to be in that place and grow in my relationship with God. And maybe we start out good and we go three weeks and five weeks and seven weeks and we're doing really good, but all of a sudden life gets busy, doesn't it? And we just start to fade away and we just kind of stop doing it. We started out really good, but we didn't finish so well. Or maybe God's calling us to really grow in our relationship with him by reading his word and getting, getting the Bible in our hearts and in our minds and praying and engaging our hearts every single day with God, starting our day with God and building our relationship with him. And so we, we get up early before the kids, before anybody else, and we start off really good and we do good for like a day or two, if you're anything like me, or maybe a week. And all of a sudden, I hit the snooze button one day. I want to get up. I'm tired. You know what I mean? Life's busy. And before I know it, those things just kind of get pushed out of our lives. We started out really good, but we didn't finish so well. And I was kind of thinking about my own life, like, why, why is that? Why can I be a good starter but not a great finisher? Some of, some of the reasons in my own life is maybe because as I started something, it was a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. Like, I, like that workout. I started out good. I thought it was going to be easy, running the exercise after exercise. But halfway through, I'm like, this is, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. And there's some things in my life when I, I started out doing it, it's harder than I thought, and it ended up not finishing so well. I end up quitting. Or, or maybe I'll start something, and I get out doing it, and I don't see the results that I want right away, or I don't see the results that I want when I want them, and so that I can not finish. Well, I, start, I start good, but I don't necessarily finish well, or, or maybe I get out doing it, and, and I just think, man, I just can't do this, kind of like the work. I just can't finish this, and so what's the point? I'm just going to quit right now. Quit while I'm ahead, so to speak. I start out great, but I don't necessarily finish well. Maybe you can relate to me this morning. And my prayer for our time together as we look at this example in the life of Nehemiah is that, that God would begin to stir this passion and this determination in us that we would finish what God's called us to start. Now we push through and we'd finish strong. And so let's start off by taking a look at Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1. It says, when the word came to Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem, the, the Arab, and, and just so we're on the same page, work with me. Are these the good guys or are these the bad guys? Okay. Nobody knows. These are the bad guys. So are these the good guys or are they the bad guys? They're the bad guys. And actually throughout this story, these three guys have consistently tried to, to get in Nehemiah's way and stop him from finishing what God called him to start. And so Nehemiah is saying, when the word came to Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, check this out, and not a gap was left in it. I love that part of the scripture. It's almost like Nehemiah's taking a little pride in his work. He's taking a step back, looking at the wall, and there's not even a gap in that. He's almost surprised himself. Like, I'm not an architect. I, I'm not in construction. Like, I didn't even know what I was doing. I just stepped up to do what God was calling me to do. And there is not even a gap in that wall. How, how many of us know whenever we step out to do what God's calling us to do, we'll be surprised and even blown away by the results? Like, I didn't think I had it in me, but look at what God did through me. 
And I just feel like a word for some of us this morning is that you need to pause in your life because if you're anything like me, you can get so focused on what's not working, all the things that you got to fix, where you fall short, all your problems, all your, all your issues. And there's, just a t- there's moments in our life where we need to pause, take a step back, and look at the wall and say, man, look at all that you've done in my life, God. Look at how far I've already come. I might not be where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. So I'm going to be encouraged by the fact there's not even a gap in the, God, thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you for what you're doing in my marriage. My marriage might not be where I want it to be, but we're not where we used to be. We're growing. We're still here. We're still fighting. We're still grinding. We're still doing what you're calling us to do. I'm going to have to take a step back. God, there's not even a gap in that wall. Look at what you're doing in my life. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by how far I still have to go, but instead I'm going to be encouraged by how far I've already come. Six months ago, I had 10 things I was dealing with, but as I stepped out and trust God and pursued it, I'm only dealing with three things right now. There's not even a gap in that wall. God, thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you how you're setting me free. Thank you how you're moving, God. I didn't even think I'd be here. I was just a cupbearer in Persia for the king, and I stepped out to trust you, and now I'm in Jerusalem, and the wall, there's not even a gap in the entire stinking wall to protect my people. God, look at what you're doing in me. Look at what you're doing through me and the lives that I'm impacting as I simply just trust you. God, there's not even a gap in the wall. I praise you, God. And if you brought me this far, man, I know you'll see me through. I know I can finish what you called me to start. Because he goes on to say, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. Nehemiah was almost there. He was almost finished, but not quite. As we take a look at this example and this story of Nehemiah, I want us to grab a hold of this spiritual principle this morning. So if you're taking notes, write this down. And that is, the closer you get to doing what God wants done the harder your enemy will fight to stop you. You need to know that. The closer you get to doing what God wants done, the harder your enemy will fight to stop you. How many of us have ever noticed that when we step out to do what God wants us to do, that we experience some resistance along the way? Remember what we talked last week? We don't face spiritual opposition because we're doing something wrong. We face spiritual opposition because we're doing something right. And maybe, you, maybe you've experienced that in this series where God's been stirring you to change the world around you and to step out of your comfort zone and do and go where God's calling you to go. And maybe, maybe God's doing some amazing things in your life. Maybe God's doing some amazing things through you. And you're on the verge of accomplishing it, but all of a sudden you run into some resistance. Maybe you're a student and God has placed it on your heart. He's given you this burden, just like Nehemiah, to see this, the students around you, your classmates, come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and have an encounter with his presence and never be the same. And so you step out and God's doing some incredible things through you, but all of a sudden you start experiencing some resistance to stop you from finishing what God called you to start. Or maybe you're like, man, I know, I know, I want to have a godly marriage. And so I go to my spouse and say, we need to get into a marriage small group to to grow in our relationship with God, to grow in our relationship with each other and get around other couples who are doing the same thing. And you and your spouse are like, yeah, let's do it. We got to go. God's calling us. We can't stay here. We got to go. And so you get online, you sign up for the small group, and all of a sudden it comes night for the first group. And all of a sudden someone's late. Someone, hypothetically, someone's late, someone's rude, and all of a sudden on the way to group, all hell breaks loose, and you are going at it, you are fighting, and you never actually make it to group. You, you started out well, but you didn't finish what God called you to start. You were so close, but then you realize that the closer we get to doing what God wants done, the harder our spiritual enemy fights to stop us. And how many of us know we're all in a spiritual battle? If you don't know you're in a spiritual battle, you need, you need to know that today. You are in a spiritual battle. Romans chapter 7 would be a great chapter of scripture for you to read because Paul's talking about the struggle each and every one of us have, the battle that each and every one of us are in. Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do when the very thing I want to do, I don't do, and the very thing I hate, these things I keep on doing? 
Anybody ever felt like that? And Paul's describing this spiritual battle that each and every one of us are in. And he concludes by saying, thanks be to Jesus who will rescue. He goes, who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to Jesus Christ, right? He's the answer, but I know I'm in this spiritual battle. And Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us that we don't fight against people. Too often we think the, the battle is with the people standing around us or our coworkers or our neighbors. Our fight is not against people, against flesh and blood, but we have a spiritual enemy who would love nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. We have a spiritual enemy who would love nothing more than to stop us from finishing what God called us to start. But one thing that's cool about God is that whenever our enemy tries to take us out, God always has a plan not only to keep us in, but to move us forward and take the very thing the our enemy of our soul is trying to use to destroy us and use it to deliver us if we know where to look. In other words, it's not our situations that determine whether or not we have the courage to finish strong and see it through, but instead how we see our situations that determine whether or not we have the courage to finish what God called us to start. And so this morning, I just want to give us two strategies of our spiritual enemy that he tries to attack us with. And what I want us to understand is with each strategy, it's always an attempt to take away your confidence. It's, a, it's an attempt to take away your confidence because the, our spiritual enemy knows if he can take away your confidence, you won't step out and do what God's calling you to do. You won't finish what God called you to start. If he can just get your confidence, if he can take away your confidence in yourself, if he can take away your confidence in your God, he can keep you stuck right where you're at. And some of us this morning, you come in, man, I'm just stuck. I'm just stagnant. I'm not going anywhere. I'm telling you, one of the ways, reasons you are is because the enemy of your soul has taken your confidence away. And so as you're taking notes this morning, the first strategy of our spiritual enemy, number one, is that your enemy will attack your character. Your enemy will attack your character and in that try to take away your confidence so that you don't finish what God called you to start. And we see this in the story of Nehemiah. Check it out. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Everybody say Ono. If anybody ever invites you to Ono, don't you go-go. You know what I'm saying? Do not do that. And here we see Nehemiah's enemies try and lure him outside of the city. They're, they're trying to, because Ono was actually seven miles outside the city, they're trying to get him away from the very place God called him to be, and they're lying to him, acting like they want to make peace with him. It goes on to say, Nehemiah tells us, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply, I'm carrying on a great project, and I don't got time to come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? I love this example that, that Nehemiah gives to us, that he doesn't even give credibility to what they're trying to do in his life. In fact, he sends messengers down to deal with it so that he can finish what God called him to start. He can keep doing what God's calling him to do. And as I was kind of studying this scripture out and thinking about my own life, I thought it was a great example, at least for me, maybe you can relate, for me to focus on the things that I can control and stop wasting my time with all the things that I can't. I, I learned a long time ago, I can't control people. Either you're with me or you're not with me. Either you're going in the same direction that I'm going in or you're not. Either you're on my side or you're not. Either you're on the same page as me or you're not. I can't control you, but I'm going here. I had to make my mind up. This is what I'm doing. God called me here. Either you're, with, you're welcome to come with me, but I'm going. My decision doesn't depend on you or the people. Around. I've already made my decision. I'm focusing on what I can control. I'm not wasting my time with the things that I can't. Either you're with me, you're not. God bless you. You can do what you can do. I'm going. Anybody with me this morning? And I feel like someone needs to hear that. There's some people in your life that you are allowing to stay in your inner circle, but they don't want to go where you want to go. They're not going where God's calling you to go. You got to make the decision. Control what you can control. Go where you want to go. If they want to come with you, cool, but you're going. Make that decision in your life this morning. He goes on to say, four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave the same answer. I don't need to change my answer up. It's the same. No. No, I'm not. 
going. Our spiritual enemy will try and wear us down, but we just have to keep saying the same thing and reminding ourselves and our spiritual enemy that if God is for me, who can be against me? If God's called, I'm going to God. This, I'm going after God's plan. I don't care about anything else. I, I, I've got this laser light focus to do what God's called me to do. He goes on to say, then the fifth time comes. How I many know our, our spiritual enemy is persistent? He just doesn't get it, even though he's already been defeated. Then the fifth time, Sambalot sent his aid to me with the same message, but it's got a little bit of a twist here. And in his hand was an unsealed letter. And this is, this is where Nehemiah's enemies try to blackmail him. Because this was a fake letter that they had come up with, that they had written. And they were, they were lying to Nehemiah, telling them that they were going to send this letter back to the king of Persia, back to King Artaxerxes. And in this letter it said that Nehemiah and the rest of the Jewish people that were rebuilding this wall had rebelled against him. They turned their backs on him. And the people were going to raise Nehemiah up to be their new king. And they were threatening Nehemiah, we're going to send this letter, bro. We're going to send it back to the king, and you're going down. He's going to come take you out. And, and Nehemiah's enemies were attacking his character. You're not who you say that you are. We, you're, not, you're not who God calls you to be. I'm attacking your character. And maybe our spiritual enemy has done the same thing with us. You know who you really are. You know where you've been. You know what you've done. You know what these hands have, have touched you. You know what these eyes have seen. You know what this mouth has said. And you start questioning yourself. You start questioning God's call on your life. You start questioning what God called you to do. Maybe, maybe I can't build a wall. Maybe, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I can't be who God called me to be. Maybe, maybe this Christian life isn't for me. I mean, I tried and I just, maybe this is who I really am. Maybe I'm just always going to struggle. Maybe I can't change the world around me. But something I want us to know this morning, that whenever our spiritual enemy attacks our character, write this down. Your integrity will see you through. It's your integrity that will see you through. Well, what's integrity? Integrity is when my behavior lines up with my beliefs. It's when what I say is what I do. It's when my private life lines up with my public life. And some of us this morning might say, man, I know deep down that I'm not living the life of integrity that I should be. That, that, my, that my character actually doesn't match my call. That, that I don't have the integrity that I so desperately need. And that, that's the foothold I keep giving to the enemy in my life. My life doesn't live up. My behavior doesn't match my beliefs. And therefore, the enemy of my soul keeps getting, I keep giving him a foothold. And he's robbing me of my confidence. And I keep staying stuck right where I'm at. But I want you to know, it's not too late to flip the script in your life and live a, live a life that's above reproach. That's the beauty of Christianity. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It only matters what you're going to do and where you're going to go from this day forward. And we can make that decision, man, I'm going to live a life of integrity today. Now, that my private life will match my public life. That, that my behavior will match my beliefs. And I, I love the example that, that King David gives to us in the Bible. Because King David messed up more than any of us probably will ever mess up in our lives. See, he committed adultery with another man's wife. He got her pregnant. Then he tried to lie to her husband to make him, him think that it was her, his child. And when that didn't work, he ended up having uh, her husband killed. And he realized that he got confronted that his behavior did not line up with his beliefs. And there were some consequences to his actions. How many know that's true? There's consequences to the decisions that we make. And he had to go through those consequences. But he fell down on his knees and he cried out to God and he asked God to forgive him. And he wrote Psalms 51, one of my favorite psalms, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Restore to me the, the joy of my salvation. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, do a work in my heart. And he cried out to God and asked God for forgiveness. And at the end of his life, he became known not for what he did. He wasn't known as an adulterer. He, he wasn't known as a liar. He, he wasn't known as a murderer. He was known as a man after God's own heart. How do you get there after what you did? That's the beauty of Jesus. That's the beauty of the cross. It doesn't matter where I've been. It matters where I'm going. 
He wasn't even known as those things that he did. And maybe some of us need to hear that this morning. Man, you are not going to be labeled by what you've done as you step into a new life and live a life of integrity, honoring God with who God called you to be. Man, living a life of integrity. But what's interesting, and I was talking to the men on Friday night. Any warriors in the house this morning? A couple of you are here. I'm talking to men Friday night, and I was telling them, whenever we get into this, this, this places of our lives where we lack confidence, because we're all there, don't we? We all face things in our life where we just don't have the confidence to do what God's called us to do. We feel unprepared. We feel inadequate. We just start to lose confidence in ourselves. Our natural default response to feeling like that is to shrink back. But I told the men Friday night, the, in those moments of our lives, it's, it's when we need to rise up the most. When I want to shrink back and I'm losing confidence and the enemy of my soul is, is attacking my character, and he is right. I did do those things, but I'm not going to shrink back and run from this. Instead, I'm going to rise up and run to it and be the man that he's called, to be, called me to be. I'm going to live a life of integrity. I'm going to be a man above reproach. It's our integrity that sees us through. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3, it says it this way. The integrity of the upright does what? It guides them. Because there's all moments where we start questioning ourselves. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know, is this God's plan? Can I even accomplish this? Can I even do it? But it's my integrity that guides me through the storm and through those cloudy moments in my life. When our spiritual enemy attacks our character, our integrity sees us through. And this is exactly what happens in Nehemiah's life. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 8. Nehemiah goes, this is what I told him. I sent them this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is even happening you're just making all that stuff up in your head. It doesn't even affect Nehemiah. It doesn't even penetrate his heart. In other words, I know who I am. I know who I am behind closed doors. I got problems. I got issues. I don't, I'm not perfect, but I'm living a life of integrity. That my behavior matches my beliefs. That, my, that what I say lines up with what I do. That my private life matches my public life. And because of that, I can just keep on going where God's calling me to go and keep on doing what God is calling me to do. I'm not getting tripped up. I'm not getting stopped. I can just set my face like Flint and continue to move forward because I'm not going to fall for the tricks of the enemy because I know who I am. And who I am isn't based on my behavior as much as it is based on what God says that I am. And because of his grace in my life, his grace teaches me to say no to ungodliness, First Timothy tells us, right? And the more I experience his grace in my life, the more I just do what he's called me to do. That's good stuff, Pastor. You're killing it this morning. I love it. And so the first strategy of, of our spiritual enemy is to try, to try and attack our character, but it's our integrity that will see us through. The second strategy of, of our spiritual enemy, number two, if you're taking notes, is that your enemy will attack your competency. Our enemy will attack our competency, and as he does, he tries to take away our confidence so that we don't finish what God called us to start. And we see this in the story of Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 9. Nehemiah says this, I realize this, that they were all trying to, to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and they will not be able to complete it. If, if we can attack their competency, we can cut steel and take away their confidence and keep them from doing what God called them to start. And let me ask us a question this morning. Have you ever been surrounded in your life by uncertainty? Ever been surrounded by just problems in your life? Maybe regret, maybe, maybe you hurt, to the point you just, you just didn't know if you had it in you. I, I just don't know if I can do this. I just don't know if I can finish what God called me to start. I just don't know if I can do what God's called me to do. And I, if I can be really honest with you this morning, I felt this way when God called us to plant Experience Church. I just, I just struggled with the thought of being a pastor. I didn't grow up wanting to be a pastor. I still don't really want to be a pastor, if I'm really honest with it. I don't care about being pa a pastor, about titles. I just love God, and God did something in my life, and he changed me from the inside out. I spent three and a half years in carcer. I was addicted to drugs, and then I had an encounter with his grace and with his love and with his freedom and with his forgiveness and his life, and he changed me from the inside out. And I just had the heart. I want more people to experience what I experienced because back, at, back in my drug days when I was smoking weed, doing all this. I tried to get everybody else to try because I thought it was the greatest thing. And then I realized I had an encounter with God. And he, he, man, he was way better than anything that I could have ever experienced in my life. The freedom, the joy, the happiness, the peace, 
the contentment, and I just wanted everybody to experience the real thing. I realized I had been taking part in the counterfeit stuff all my life, and when I really had a taste of the real thing, I want everybody to experience that, more of God. And it led me to this, this direction and this moment in my life to be a pastor. But if I'm really honest with you, I struggled with the idea. Like, like I'm just not smart enough. Like, who would want to come to this place called Experience Church without the E and, and, and listen to me talk about something as important as the Word of God? Anybody else felt like that with what God's calling you to do? Anybody else felt like, I'm just inadequate, I just don't, have, I don't, I just don't know if I can do it. I just I, I'm not smart enough. If you're anything like me, I, sometimes I feel I'm not godly enough. I mess up too much. I got too many struggles. I can't I do what you're calling me to do, but, but here's what I discovered in my own life, that when the enemy tries to attack our competency, write this down, it's your dependency on God that will see you through. In other words, you come to the point in your life where you have to ask yourself the question, who do you depend on? Who do you put your trust in day in and day out? Because how many of us know when we step out to do what God's calling us to do, he will always call us to do something greater than ourselves, something bigger than us. Nehemiah didn't know how to build a stinking wall. He wasn't an architect. He wasn't in construction. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just some ordinary cup bearer who decided to take a step out of his comfort zone and be willing to follow God wherever he was going to lead him, and it led him to rebuild this stinking wall. He wasn't trusting in himself. His hope wasn't in himself. And we see this in the second part of Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9. Check it out. Nehemiah goes this, but I prayed. When the enemy attacks my competency, when I feel like, man, I don't, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I have what it takes. I've never been a pastor before. I don't know. If, well, you know what Nehemiah did? He fell on his knees and he prayed. God, you're where my hope is. You're my, is where my strength comes from. God, he got down on his knees and he prayed, God, strengthen my hands. God, if you call me to do this, you'll give me the strength to complete it. Nehemiah's hope wasn't in himself. His trust wasn't in himself. It's the same thing that God's calling each and every one of us to do today. Whenever the enemy of our soul attacks our competency, man, it's our dependency that will see us through. My hope's in you, God. My trust is in you, God. I, I don't know if I could. I, I don't have what it takes to be a single mom. I don't know how to parent this child who I'm not their biological parent. I've never faced these struggles and these, these issues as a, as a parent. I'm in new territory. I've never been here before. I've never had to fight through this peer pressure like this before. I, I've never faced any of this. I've never done what you're calling me to do. I don't know how to help somebody in need, but my hope and my trust isn't in me, God. My hope and trust is in you. I'm trust in the one that's greater. God, if you call me this, you'll see me through. And I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. He says he's having the same moment. I love the fact that the apostle Paul, you could say one of the greatest characters in the Bible, right, ever, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And I love the fact that he used to murder Christians and had an encounter with God. It just makes me feel better about myself that this guy was more screwed up than me. And look at how God used him. Like he was messed up, but look at what God did in him, and look at what God did through him. And he writes two-thirds of the New Testament. But I love the fact that even in his moments, even in, in, in this new life that God gave him, there's still moments where he questions himself, and he, he's lacking confidence in himself, and, he, and, and the enemy of his soul is, is attacking his competency. So he's having this moment with God, and God responds to him like this, my grace is sufficient for you. Whew. Man, I think somebody needs to hear that this morning. In other words, you know what God's saying to him? I believe in you. I believe in you. Paul's going, I, I don't know. You know where I've been, God, and I don't know if I have what it takes to do, and I don't, I'm just messed up, and you know, you know all the, the struggles, all the mistakes, and I'm not smart enough, and I'm not good enough, and I mess up too much, I sin too much, God. You know, I don't know if I can do it. I don't have the confidence, and God comes alongside and goes, I believe in you. And I wonder who needs to hear that this morning. I believe in you. I don't care where you've been. I believe in you. I don't care how much you mess up. I believe in you. My grace is sufficient for you. I keep going. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't give. I believe. There's something, there's something that happens in us when people start to believe in us. And there's something even greater that happens in us when we realize God believes in us. Maybe I can do this. 
Maybe I, can, maybe I can pick myself back up and keep going where God's called me to go. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. It never runs out, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my, my weaknesses. I, I, I wonder if Paul's getting kind of cute there. Oh, well, then I'm just messed up. I'm just a room one screwed up guy. I'll just boast all the more of how messed up I am and how screwed up I am. If that's the case, God, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I'm not dependent upon myself, but I'm dependent on Christ and his power that's at work within me. Paul goes on to say, that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. Why? Because those things have taught me that apart from God, I can do nothing. But with Christ, through Christ, I can do all things. For when I am weak, he said, I start depending on somebody else. When I realize that I don't have it, I start looking for somebody else to pass the ball to. I don't want to shoot the shot. God, where are you at? Let me pass the ball to you. Give you control of my situation. Give you control of my life. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, you know what Paul's saying here? Paul's saying, I learned to see God's strength through my struggle. I learned to see God's strength in me through my struggle. In other words, if you're struggling today, you got some issues, you got some opposition, there's some things coming at you, that actually could be a good thing if you will allow it to move you into a greater dependency on God. It's in my week. Maybe that's why God's using me to be a pastor, because I realize I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. And God's going, hey, hey, that's great that you're recognizing your weaknesses. Now I can use you, because my power can be strong in you. My grace can be stronger in you. My anointing can be strong. You can get out of the way and let me do what I want to do the whole time in and through your life. Some of us this morning, you just got to get out of the way. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to do it all. Stop trying to control it and make it happen. Just get out of the way and let God do what he's been trying to do in your life all along. Paul said, man, I learned to see God's strength through my struggle. And so this morning, man, if the enemy is attacking your character, it's your integrity that will see you through. If your enemy is attacking your competency, it's your dependency on God that will see you through. And so this morning, as we kind of close, I'm going to give us two thoughts to help us finish what God called us to start, help us finish strong. So if you're taking notes this morning, I want to encourage you, focus on where you're going, not where you've been. You need to focus on where you're going, not where you've been. Paul says it like this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, not that I've already obtained it, I haven't finished yet. I made some progress God's been doing some work in my life. I'm going. I'm not where I've been. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not, I'm not where I've been. I'm making some progress, but there's still some work to be done in my life or that I've already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. God's doing something in me, and as God starts to do something in me, man, I know God wants to do something through me. God's, God's taking a hold of me. Some, something's different in me. As I've just come to church, I've just lifted my hands, as I've worshipped, as i pray, prayed, God's doing a work in me. As I've just simply opened my heart up to his truth and his presence, something's happening in me. He goes on to say, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. And I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Maybe some of you this morning, that's all you came to get. This morning, that's all you need to get at church this morning. Forget what is behind and start straining to what's up ahead. Focus on where you're going, not where you've been. And the enemy of our soul always wants to remind us where we've been, right? And he wants, to, he wants us not to focus on where God's trying to take us. I don't want you, don't, don't worry about where you're going. Just keep focusing on where you've been. But one thing I do, man, I'm forgetting what is behind and I'm press on and I strain towards what God has for me up ahead. The second thought I want to give to us this morning to help us finish strong is simply this. Focus on what God said, not what you see. Focus on what God said, not what you see. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8 says this. For we walk by faith not by sight, and then check out what happens when we do. 
and we are confident. There's this confidence that comes back in me when I just get my eyes off of my situation and I get my eyes on the cross. When I look up to the heavens and I understand where my strength comes from, man, there's just something that happens in me. I just got this confidence. Even I don't even realize how big the situation is because I'm looking at about how big my God is. And all of a sudden I'm like, holy crap, I just built a wall around the city of Jerusalem and I didn't even realize what I was doing. I just looked up to the heavens where my strength comes from. Look at what you did in my life, God. I walk by faith, not by sight. And I'm confident in you, God. I'm confident in you. Yes, Lord. In other words, can I just say this? We, we got to stop listening to ourselves and start talking to ourselves. Stop listening to all the reasons why you're going to fail. Stop listening to all the reasons why you can't. Stop listening to all the reasons why it's just not going to work and start talking to yourself. Man, my God's bigger than what I see in front of me. God's bigger than the obstacles that I'm facing. God's bigger than what people are saying. God's bigger than what people are trying to do to me. This is who I am. This is what God's called me to do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yes, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We trust you. Our hope's in you, God. Our strength's in you, God. We love you, God. Look at what you're doing in us, God. Look what you're doing through us, God. There's more. I can't do it. I'm not quitting. I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep going. Come on. We're not done yet. I would tell you to sit down, but we are that kind of church. I'm going to close with this, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 through 16. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. This wall that had been down for 140 years. What's some things in your life that have been down? What's some things in your life that have been broken that God's called you to rebuild? What are some things that you say, man, there's just no way that can happen, and God's calling you to something greater. And you know what I love about this story? It wasn't like lightning fell. It wasn't like they, they, they went to bed that night and they woke up and the wall was built. Sometimes we wish God would just fix all of our problems, don't we? Sometimes I wish I could just go to sleep, God, give you all my stuff and wake up and it's all fixed. I'd love to just win the lottery and take care of all my problems, even though I don't play the lottery, right? I just fix it all, God. Do it. But I love this. You know how this, this miracle happened? Strong leadership and determination. Strong leadership and I'm just determined to do. I'm just determined, I'm determined. I'm gonna run into some struggles. I'm gonna run into some opposition. I'm gonna fall down, I'm gonna fail. But I'm gonna keep getting back up in God's grace. I'm determined to be who you called me to be. I'm determined to have the marriage you've called me to have. I'm determined to be the father and the mother that you've called me. I'm determined for my kids to know your grace and your love at an early age. I'm determined my kids to have a better life than I had and a better upbringing than I'm had. I'm determined to reach the people people around me. I'm determined for other people to experience His love like I've experienced and got to change them like God's changed me. I'm determined that people don't have to keep on using drugs to find happiness. I'm determined, I'm determined that you don't have to keep running to a bottle to get some peace in your life. That you can get the real thing. I'm determined more people would have an encounter with His grace and never be the same. I'm determined. He says, when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence. Why? Because they realized that this work hadn't been done by people, but through the help of our God. Everybody realized that what every, everybody said was impossible happened through the help of our God. I want to leave you with this scripture, Galatians 6, 9. The Bible tells us, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary in well-doing. For after a while, at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest. If you don't get discouraged and quit, if you don't quit, give up, just keep grinding, keep going. I know there's difficult days, but the difficult days make the, the, the easy days that much sweeter, right? The, hey, it took me, as I grinded and just climbed the mountain, it made the top of the mountain that much sweeter. If I didn't go through all the hardships, man, the victories wouldn't be as sweet. If it was just easy all the time, I wouldn't appreciate all that God is doing in my life. So I just welcome the struggles, but I know that in Him, I'm victorious. So the question I want to ask us this morning is, what's God called you to finish? What's He called you to finish? Because how many know, God didn't call us to, to start something and not finish it. What He called us to start, He called us to finish. 
What's he want you to do? Maybe God's been doing something in you. Maybe the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and all of a sudden God's been doing a work in life, and you just kind of fell off a little bit. What's he calling you to finish? God's called us to change the world around us. And as we surrender to his power, his glory, his truth, his anointing, his strength, God does a work in us, and he does a work through us. And what people said was impossible are possible with him. All of a sudden, I'm like, you go to church? Here's the one I heard. You're a pastor? You're, hold up, Kyle. You, what do you do again? You're a pastor? You didn't even graduate from high school. You, you were strung out on drugs. You were incarcerated. Last time I saw you, you, last time I heard about you, you were incarcerated somewhere. You were locked up somewhere. No, you're, you do what? Look, what is God doing through you? God wants to use ordinary people like us to change the world around us. Amen? Yeah. So, Father, we come into this place, God. We thank you for your grace in your life, how you change it all, God. Your love, God. Thank you for believing in us, no matter where we're at in our life. You believe in us. God, you always love us and encourage us to a higher height, to new levels, God. Thank you, God, for your love that never, ever fails, God. And this morning, as we're in this place, God, you called us to be ordinary world changers. God, I pray you give us the courage to step out of our comfort zones and do what you're calling us to do and go where you're calling us to go, God. Give us the courage to be all that you've called us to be, God. And when our enemy tries to come in and attack our character, God, we don't shrink back. We rise up and we become even more men and women of integrity, even more men and women above reproach. God, when our enemy tries to attack our competency, man, we realize that in our weakness, you're made strong. We depend on you, God. You're our hope. You're our strength, God. God, I pray this morning that you would help us to focus on where we're going, not where we've been. To focus on on what you said, God, not what we see. That you would do a work in us and do what God changed. I pray this community, our workplaces, our families, our neighborhoods, our friendships would never be the same, all because a group of ordinary people decided to take a step of faith and change the world around them. And as we're praying this morning, maybe you know your first step is to simply say, God, here's my life. Surrender your life to God. Maybe God's calling you to more. And it starts with a relationship with God, not joining a church, not obeying a bunch of rules. It simply says, God, here's my life. Here's my heart. Here's all the good, the bad, and the ugly, God. I surrender my life to you. I want to know you. I want to have an ongoing personal relationship with you. That's what God wants for us. That's when my life started changing, when I simply surrendered and said, here I am, God. I don't know. I'm hurting. I'm confused. I don't know where to go, but God, I just, here's my life. Change me. Heal me. Forgive me. Do a work in me. And if that's you this morning, would you lift your hand up right where you're at? I'm not going to call you the front or embarrass you. As you lift your hand in this place this morning, as you pray this prayer with me, God, thank you for your love. Thank you for believing in me, that your grace is sufficient. And this morning, I give you my life. I surrender it all to you, God. God, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for sending your one and only son, Jesus, to pay the price for my sin on the cross. Here's my life, God. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live, God. My life is yours in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise in this place.